Chapter Eleven, Part Two of *The Many-Sided Franklin* by Paul Lester Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter Eleven, Politician and Diplomat, Part Two. As this implied, Franklin was a warm partisan of the connection between Great Britain and her colonies. Even after the Stamp and Revenue Acts should have shown him how selfishly bent on her own narrow interest the mother country was, he ascribed those measures solely to the corrupt Parliament and expressed the hope that, quote, nothing that has happened or may happen will diminish in the least our loyalty to our sovereign or affection for this nation in general i can scarcely conceive a king of better dispositions of more exemplary virtues or more truly desirous of promoting the welfare of all his subjects the experience we have had of the family in the two preceding mild reigns and the good temper of our young princes so far as can yet be discovered promise us a continuance of this felicity End quote. As for the colonies, he said, they had not only a respect but an affection for Great Britain, for its laws, its customs and manners, and even a fondness for its fashions that greatly increased the commerce. Natives of Britain were always treated with particular regard. To be an old England man was, of itself, a character of some respect, and gave a kind of rank among us." End quote. Thus he wrote when America was ablaze with opposition to the parliamentary acts, but still he could assert, quote, And yet there remains among the people so much respect, veneration, and affection for Britain, that if cultivated prudently with a kind usage and tenderness for their privileges, they might be easily governed still for ages, without force or any considerable expense but i do not see here a sufficient quantity of wisdom that is necessary to produce such a conduct and i lament the want of it End quote. in answer to the charge that the colonies desired independence he replied the americans have too much love for their mother country and he assured lord chatham that Quote, having more than once travelled almost from one end of the continent to the other and kept a great variety of company eating drinking and conversing with them freely i never had heard in any conversation from any person drunk or sober the least expression of a wish for a separation or hint that such a thing would be advantageous to america End quote feeling this strong loyalty himself franklin worked unendingly to prevent the breach convinced as he was that the government cannot long be maintained without the union of the two he retorted when it was urged that in time the colonies by their growth would become the dominant half quote, which is best supposing your case to have a total separation or a change of the seat of government End quote early and late he preached the necessity of a closer union but it fell on ears deafened by self and immediate interests and he was forced to acknowledge that all his arguments were in vain for quote, the parliament here do at present think too highly of themselves to admit representatives from us if we should ask it and when they will be desirous of granting it we shall think too highly of ourselves to accept it it would certainly contribute to the strength of the whole if ireland and all the dominions were united and consolidated under one common council for general purposes each retaining its particular council or parliament for its domestic concerns but this should have been early provided for in the infancy of our foreign establishments it was neglected or was not thought of and now the affair is nearly in the situation of friar bacon's project of making a brazen wall around england for its eternal security his servant friar bungy slept while the brazen head which was to dictate how it might be done said time is and time was he only waked to hear it say time is past an explosion followed that tumbled their house about the conjurer's ears End quote if such a union he argued were now established which methinks it highly imports this country to establish it would probably subsist as long as britain shall continue as a nation 
this people however is too proud and too much despises the americans to bear the thought of admitting them to such an equitable participation in the government of the whole every man in england he complained seems to consider himself as a piece of a sovereign over america seems to jostle himself into the throne with the king and talks of our subjects in the colonies and with real indignation he charged that quote, angry writers use their utmost efforts to persuade us that this war with the colonies for a war it will be is a national curse when in fact it is a ministerial one End quote the british he maintained have no idea that any people can act from any other principle but that of interest and they believe that three pence in a pound of tea of which one does perhaps drink ten pounds in a year is sufficient to overcome all the patriotism of an american End quote in noting however that the english feel but they do not see that is they are sensible of inconveniences when they are present but do not take sufficient care to prevent them he was too inherently fair-minded not to acknowledge the faults of the colonies as well and especially of those politicians who were striving to foment divisions Quote, i think the new yorkers have been very discreet in forbearing to write and publish against the late act of parliament he wrote to a friend in america i wish the boston people had been as quiet since governor bernard has sent over all their violent papers to the ministry and wrote them word that he daily expected a rebellion End quote when the mob in boston destroyed the tea he grieved over a lawlessness which had united all parties in england against the american cause and though he was the agent for massachusetts he risked his position by honestly telling the leaders in that province that quote, i cannot but hope that the affair of the tea will have been considered in the assembly before this time and satisfaction proposed if not made for such a step will remove much of the prejudice now entertained against us and put us again on a fair footing in contending for our old privileges as occasion may require End quote when his advice was disregarded he complained and so we shall go on injuring and provoking each other instead of cultivating that good will and harmony so necessary to the general welfare End quote. again and again he begged the extremists in massachusetts not to excite the people for all the ends desired could be gained by peaceful methods far more certainly than by law-breaking and violence Quote, in the meantime i must hope that great care will be taken to keep our people quiet he advised since nothing is more wished for by our enemies than by insurrections we should give a good pretense for increasing the military among us and putting us under more severe restraints End quote his fear he declared was that imprudencies on both sides may step by step bring on the most mischievous consequences it is imagined here that this act will enforce immediate compliance and if the people should be quiet content themselves with the laws they have and let the matter rest till in some future war the king wanting aids from them and finding himself restrained in his legislation by the act as much as the people shall think fit by his ministers to propose the repeal the parliament will be greatly disappointed and perhaps it may take this turn i wish nothing worse may happen End quote. but if the people could be kept quiet for a time franklin held the outcome could not be doubtful it must be evident he affirmed that by our rapidly increasing strength we shall soon become of so much importance that none of our just claims of privilege will be as heretofore unattended to nor any security we can wish for our rights be denied us so he counseled even a submission to the parliamentary encroachments certain that their period must be brief the colonies are rapidly increasing in wealth and numbers he pointed out in the last war they maintained an army of twenty five thousand a country able to do that is no contemptible ally in another war they may perhaps do twice as much with equal ease whenever a war happens our aid will be wished for our friendship desired and cultivated our good will courted then is the time to say redress our grievances you take money from us by force and now you ask it of voluntary grant 
you cannot have it both ways if you choose to have it without our consent you must go on taking it in that way and be content with what little you can so obtain if you would have our free gifts desist from your compulsive methods and acknowledge our rights and secure our future enjoyment of them our claims will then be attended to and our complaints regarded End quote however much he might counsel moderate opposition and even temporary submission he did so because he believed it the most certain way of obtaining justice from great britain and not because he thought her conduct either prudent or justifiable long before the attempt to tax the colonies and so far as known before any other american had protested against such a course he claimed that quote, it is supposed to be an undoubted right of englishmen not to be taxed but by their own consent given through their representatives End quote. his opposition to parliamentary taxation began with the earliest attempt to a friend he wrote depend upon it my good neighbor i took every step in my power to prevent the passing of the stamp act nobody could be more concerned and interested than myself to oppose it sincerely and heartily but the tide was too strong against us the nation was provoked by american claims of independence and all parties joined in resolving by this act to settle the point we might as well have hindered the sun's setting that we could not do but since it is down my friend and it may be long before it rises again let us make as good a night of it as we can End quote. when contrary to his expectation the colonies refused to allow the act to be enforced and a movement to repeal the act began he told another quote, you guessed aright in supposing that i would not be a mute in that play i was extremely busy attending members of both houses informing explaining consulting disputing in a continual hurry from morning till night till the affair was happily ended during the course of it being called before the house of commons i spoke my mind pretty freely enclosed i sent you the imperfect account that was taken of that examination End quote how strongly he felt the rights of his native land was shown by something else he wrote at this time in which he asserted that quote, i can only judge of others by myself i have some little property in america i will freely spend nineteen shillings in the pound to defend the right of giving or refusing the other shilling and after all if i cannot defend that right i can retire cheerfully with my little family into the boundless woods of america which are sure to afford freedom and subsistence to any man who can bait a hook or pull a trigger while other pleaders of the american cause were striving to explain previous acquiescences in parliamentary legislation he saw the futility of such attempts and took up the one consistent position quote, the more i have thought and read on the subject the more i find myself confirmed in opinion that no middle doctrine can be well maintained i mean not clearly with intelligible arguments something might be made of either of the extremes that parliament has a power to make all laws for us or that it has a power to make no laws for us and i think the arguments for the latter more numerous and weighty than those of the former End quote. this doctrine was so in advance of what even the most extreme partisans of american rights thought of asserting that franklin never advocated it publicly on the contrary he was prepared to accept any compromise which would satisfy the two countries his purpose being to bring about a return of good feeling undoubtedly this desire to keep the middle ground was partly induced by his dual office holding for in these years in which he labored so unceasingly to prevent separation he held the royal office of joint deputy postmaster general from the crown and several agencies from the colonies and franklin loved public office too well to wish to risk the loss of either so strong in fact was the itch that upon it being hinted to him that he might be given a better crown position than that he held he did everything in his power to gain the favor of those in office a vague message from the duke of grafton suggesting this as a possibility was sufficient to make franklin assure the go-between to use his own words 
quote, I was extremely sensible of the Duke's goodness, and very thankful for his favorable disposition towards me, that having lived long in England, and contracted a friendship and affection for many persons here, it could not but be agreeable to me to remain among them some time longer, if not for the rest of my life, and that there was no nobleman to whom I could, from sincere respect for his great abilities and amiable qualities, so cordially attach myself, or to whom I should so willingly be obliged for the provision he mentioned, as to the Duke of Grafton, if his grace should think I could, in any station where he might place me, be serviceable to him and to the public." End quote as if this was not a sufficient forgetting of his own aphorism that a ploughman on his legs is higher than a gentleman on his knees for some weeks he left no stone unturned to cultivate the ministry acting on advice quote, i accordingly called at the duke's and left my card and when i went next to the treasury his grace not being there mr cooper carried me to lord north chancellor of the exchequer who said very obligingly after talking of some american affairs i am told by mr cooper that you are not unwilling to stay with us i hope we shall find some way of making it worth your while I thanked his lordship, and said I should stay with pleasure if I could anyways be useful to government. He made me a compliment, and I took my leave. The Thursday following, I received another note from Mr. Cooper, directing me to be at the Duke of Grafton's next morning, whose porter had orders to let me in. I went accordingly, and was immediately admitted but his grace being then engaged in some unexpected business with much condescension and politeness made that an apology for his not discoursing with me then but wished me to be at the treasury at twelve the next tuesday i went accordingly when mr cooper told me something had called the duke into the country and the board was put off which was not known till it was too late to send me word but he was glad i was come as he might then fix another day for me to go again with him into the country he assures me the duke has it at heart to do something for me all the office seekers complaisance however proved but a waste of time Quote, instead of me being appointed to a new office he had to tell his son there has been a motion made to deprive me of that i now hold and i believe for the same reason though that was not the reason given out viz my being too much of an american End quote once assured that he was to receive no new appointment there was an amusing change in his attitude I am now grown too old to be ambitious of such a station as that which you say has been mentioned, he wrote. Repose is more fit for me, and much more suitable to my wishes. There is no danger of such a thing being offered to me, and I am sure I shall never ask it. But even if it were offered, I certainly could not accept it to act under such instructions as I know must be given with it. End quote. Whether love of country or love of office was the governing motive for his endeavors to maintain or restore concord, he narrowly escaped the usual fate of the go-between. Because he counseled acquiescence in the Stamp Act, and had a friend nominated to a stamped commissionership, he was deemed in America to be little better than a traitor, and popular anger against him was so fanned by his political opponents that there was danger for a time of a mob taking vengeance on his family and property. Fortunately for Franklin, he was summoned before Parliament and questioned at the time that body was considering the repeal of the Stamp Act, and he published this examination in a pamphlet which proved remarkably popular, quieted the furor against him, and once more brought him into favor. Despite this self-vindication, as he continued to counsel moderate measures, Franklin was from this time mistrusted by such Whigs as James Otis, Samuel Adams, John Dickinson, R. H. Lee, and other extremists, and they did not consider him as belonging to their party. Yet this did not gain him favor with the government party in Great Britain, and after years of labor he could only describe his position as follows. Quote, 
being born and bred in one of the countries and having lived long and made many agreeable connections of friendship in the other i wish all prosperity to both but i have talked and written so much and so long on the subject that my acquaintance are weary of hearing and the public of reading any more of it which begins to make me weary of talking and writing especially as i do not find that i have gained any point in either country except that of rendering myself suspected by my impartiality in england of being too much an american and in america of being too much an englishman End quote it was in seventeen seventy four that the maintenance of this mediatorial position was made impossible to him by a famous sequence of events complaining to a gentleman of character and distinction of the sending of troops to boston and the other repressive measures franklin was assured that none of them originated with the ministry but were solicited and obtained by some of the most respectable of the americans themselves as necessary measures for the welfare of that country upon franklin doubting his statement Quote, he called on me some days after and produced to me letters from lieutenant governor hutchinson secretary oliver and others recommending the sending of troops and men of war and advising that in the colonies there must be an abridgment of what are called english liberties though astonished i could not but confess myself convinced End quote with these in his possession the colony agent believed it possible to bring about a reconciliation and he begged permission to let his countrymen know of their existence for he honestly believed that this would end the ill-feeling against great britain and place it instead upon the shoulders of the letter-writers in this judgment he was entirely correct for he was shortly able to write the colonial secretary that quote, a sincere disposition prevails in the people there to be on good terms with the mother country and it is said that having immediately discovered as they think the authors of their grievances to be some of their own people their resentment against britain is thence much abated End quote unfortunately for the hope of the colony agent the british ministry which for years had been vacillating in the policy to be pursued as regards america was at that moment in one of its numerous periods of reaction and with a folly which to-day seems unbelievable instead of availing itself of this opportunity it sought to use it as a means of destroying the one american who had consistently striven to heal the breach upon a hearing before the privy council of a petition for massachusetts bay for the removal from office of the writers of these criminatory letters instead of dealing with the petition the solicitor-general alexander wedderburn launched into a savage personal attack upon franklin whom he charged with having obtained the letters by fraud if not by theft i hope my lords he said you will mark and brand the man for the honor of this country of europe and of mankind private correspondence has hitherto been held sacred in times of the greatest party rage not only in politics but in religion he has forfeited all the respect of societies and of men into what companies will he hereafter go with an unembarrassed face or the honest intrepidity of virtue men will watch him with a jealous eye they will hide their papers from him and lock up their escritoires he will henceforth esteem it a liable to be called a man of letters homo truum that is fur or thief literarum End quote. then after reassuring the sacredness of a private correspondence he continued this property is as sacred and as precious to gentlemen of integrity as their family plate or jewels are and no man who knows the whatleys will doubt but that they would much sooner have chosen that any person should have taken their plate and sent it to holland for his avarice than that he should have secreted the letters of their friends their brother's friend and their father's friend and sent them away to boston to gratify an enemy's malice a foreign ambassador when residing here just before the breaking out of a war and upon particular occasions may bribe a villain to steal or betray any state papers he is under the command of another state and is not amenable to the laws of the country where he resides and the secure exemption from punishment may induce a laxer morality but mr franklin whatever he may teach the people at boston while he is here at least is a subject 
End quote. End of chapter 11, part 2. Chapter 11, Part 3 of The Many-Sided Franklin by Paul Lester Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 11, Politician and Diplomat, Part 3. There has been much discussion as to whether Franklin acted honorably in transmitting these letters which might have been saved had his own simple statement been properly weighed. The letters were shown him by a personal friend, a member of Parliament, whom, quote, I am not at present permitted to name, end quote, but who, Franklin asserts, was a gentleman of character and distinction. This colony agent, deeming it, quote, my duty to give my constituents intelligence of such importance to their affairs, end quote, finally won from this friend the privilege of sending the letters to the massachusetts leaders it is clear therefore that he had no reason to believe that they had been wrongfully obtained or that his friend had not the right to allow him to transmit them on the contrary franklin declared that he came by them honorably if blame there is it must rest on this still unknown man and franklin bearing all the vituperation which was heaped upon him was but sacrificing himself to shield another the probabilities favor the view that this was william straham whose position as printer to the king made it necessary that his share should remain unknown wedderburn's attack was with the facts at his disposal wholly unjustifiable and would have been without weight but for the circumstances which produced it for his speech was in truth but the expression franklin says of a court clamour raised against me as an incendiary and the decrying and the vilifying of the people of that country and me as their agent among the rest was quite a court measure his assertions are proved by the conduct of the privy council for without even a pretense of judging the cause before them during wedderburn's speech quote, all the members of the council the president himself lord dower not excepted frequently left outright end quote. another eyewitness states that he made them so far forget themselves and the character in which they officiated as to cry out hear him hear him End quote. and franklin speaks of their frequently breaking into applause one of the ablest lawyers of the period and one fitted to hold the scales impartially in his account of the trial said quote, i had the grievous mortifications to hear mr wedderburn wandering from the proper question before their lordships pour forth such a torrent of virulent abuse on dr franklin as never before took place within the compass of my knowledge of judicial proceedings his reproaches appearing to me incompatible with the principles of law truth justice propriety and humanity End quote. Franklin took this attack calmly, but none the less it stung him deeply. However bitterly he felt personally, he still, though further injured by being deprived of his office of joint deputy postmaster general, strove to bring about some agreement. I long labored in England, he asserted later, with great zeal and sincerity, to prevent the breach that has happened, and which is now so wide that no endeavors of mine can possibly heal it. You know the treatment I met with from that imprudent court, but I keep a separate account of private injuries which I may forgive, and I do not think it right to mix them with public affairs. End quote. With Lord Chatham, who sent for him, he discussed the possibility of reconciling the two countries, and was present by his invitation when the Earl made his motion in the House of Lords for the withdrawal of the troops from Boston, and again when he submitted a plan of conciliation. Indeed, Franklin was charged in the ensuing debate with being the author of it nor did he limit his efforts to those in opposition but brought into relation with lord howe the chosen instrument of the ministry already ashamed of the treatment accorded him by the earl's sister mrs howe with whom he played at chess he did his utmost to reach some common ground of agreement 
howe promised to grant franklin if he would but secure the pacification of the colonies any reward in the power of the government to bestow a promise which franklin said was to him what the french vulgarly called spitting in the soup but not taking offence he agreed that if lord howe received the appointment of commissioner to america and the propositions to that country were such as met his approval he would gladly go as his secretary he even guaranteed quote, without any instruction to warrant my so doing or assurance that i should be reimbursed or my conduct approved end quote, that the tea should be paid for if the colonies were but granted justice Quote, an engagement in which i must have risked my whole fortune end quote. all these negotiations came to nothing however and when at last convinced that it was but a waste of time he took ship for america the abuse and persecution the ministry had heaped upon franklin had not merely restored his former popularity in america but had enormously added to it he was quickly elected to the Continental Congress, to the Pennsylvania Assembly, and to the Pennsylvania Convention. Congress appointed him Postmaster General and a member of many important committees. Pennsylvania made him Chairman of the Committee of Safety, which was practically the governorship of the colony, and the Convention chose him for their President. My time, he wrote a friend, was never more fully employed in the morning at six i am at the committee of safety appointed by the assembly to put the province in a state of defence which committee holds till near nine when i am at the congress and that sits till four in the afternoon how franklin avoided so far as possible any share in the drafting of the public papers of the congress has been told already nor was he more forward in debate it was poor richard who remarked Quote, here comes the orator with his flood of words and his drop of reason End quote. and during his whole life franklin was no speechmaker i served jefferson said with general washington in the legislature of virginia before the revolution and during it with dr franklin in congress i never heard either of them speak ten minutes at a time nor to any but the main point which was to decide the question they laid their shoulders to the great points, knowing that the little ones would follow of themselves. End quote. Franklin himself bears this out by saying that, quote, I was but a bad speaker, never eloquent, subject to much hesitation in my choice of words, hardly correct in language, and yet I generally carried my points. End quote john adams in one of his periodic outbursts against the man whom the public deemed greater than himself contrasted his own services in congress in which he claimed to have been quote, active and alert in every branch of business both in the house and on committees constantly proposing measures supporting those i approved when moved by others opposing such as i disapproved discussing and arguing on every question end quote. with those of franklin who was seen adam says from day to day sitting in silence a great part of the time fast asleep in his chair End quote. yet franklin was appointed on every important committee and adams on few and the sage could he but have read his brother congressman's comparison might fairly have retorted with the wisdom of poor richard quote, he that speaks much is much mistaken or the worst wheel of the cart makes the most noise End quote. however little franklin may have seemed to have accomplished to those who elected to think so one service he attempted is not to be passed over as he had been among the first to suggest a union of the colonies under great britain so he was foremost in advocating their immediate union in their contests with the mother country and long before the majority of Congress saw the wisdom of the purpose, or were even willing to consider it, he drafted and laid before that body his Articles of Confederation, the first true step toward a national union. In the politics of Pennsylvania, too, he wielded a most dominating influence, for it was chiefly through his exertions that the old Penn Charter was abrogated, and a new Republican Constitution obtained in its stead. 
in the effecting of this change too he succeeded in finally crushing the propriety or aristocratic party which had fought him with such bitterness for over twenty years so that never again did it recover its influence in the state a blow the leading families never forgave and the resentment of which expresses itself socially even to this day in philadelphia vital as were his labors in local politics in the congress in canada at cambridge and at staten island he was more needed and in fact seems to have been preordained by nature and training for another service once the war from being an attempt to wrest rights from an acknowledged sovereign became a conflict to maintain independence the new formed country turned for assistance to france then the great enemy of britain almost alone of the congressmen franklin had traveled in that country and had both friends and repute there even more important however was the fact that already semi approaches had been made to him by those in authority years before when the excitement over the new doctrine of colonial taxation was sounding a warning which the british people would not hear there were others quick to heed the murmur of discontent and complaint and to recognize in it a means for injuring their foe as they had never yet been able to do but if the times were ripening the colony agent was not yet ready to part with old lamps for new ones du Guerchy, the french ambassador is gone home franklin relates and monsieur durand is left minister plenipotentiary he is extremely curious to inform himself in the affairs of america pretends to have a great esteem for me on account of the abilities shown in my examination has desired to have all my political writings invited me to dine with him was very inquisitive treated me with great civility makes me visits and etc i fancy that intriguing nation would like very well to meddle on occasion and blow up the coals between britain and her colonies but i hope we shall give them no opportunity not quite ten years after this was written franklin was sailing across the atlantic one of three commissioners sent to beg the aid of france and to an english friend who chided him for disloyalty franklin replied i was fond to a folly of our british connections and it was with infinite regret that i saw the necessity you would force us into of breaking it but the extreme cruelty with which we have been treated has now extinguished every thought of returning to it and separated us for ever you have thereby lost limbs that will never grow again End quote it has been said of franklin by the historian of american diplomacy that he must be considered the one true diplomat america has ever produced and when his services and the circumstances under which they were rendered are weighed the statement seems justifiable almost from the moment of his arrival in paris he came to exercise an influence with the french ministry which can hardly be exaggerated the reiterated charge of his enemies was that he was the tool of france and always acted in her interests but his successor in office jefferson who was of all men the best fitted to know the truth of this asserted quote, as to the charge of subservience to france two years of my own service with him at paris daily visits and the most friendly and confidential conversation convinced me that it had not a shadow of foundation he possessed the confidence of that government in the highest degree insomuch that it may truly be said that they were more under his influence than he under theirs the fact is that his temper was so amiable and conciliatory his conduct so rational never urging impossibilities or even things unreasonably inconvenient to them in short so moderate and attentive to their difficulties as well as our own that what his enemies called subservience i saw was only that reasonable disposition which sensible that advantages are not all to be on one's own side yielding what is just and liberal is the more certain of obtaining liberality and justice mutual confidence produces of course mutual influence and this was all which subsisted between dr franklin and the government of france End quote 
this individual opinion all the documentary evidence goes to reinforce and it is impossible in studying it not to conclude that the opposition to and attacks upon franklin by his own countrymen were due primarily to the dislike and jealousy of his fellow commissioners lee and adams who unable to compete with him in france were driven to raise a cabal against him in america composed of almost the identical elements which endeavored to bring about the removal of washington from the command of the armies and which successfully wrought the political ruin of john dickinson and robert morris dr franklin jefferson long after said had many political enemies as every character must which with decision enough to have opinions has energy and talent to give them effect on the feelings of the adversary opinion these enmities were chiefly in pennsylvania and massachusetts in the former they were merely of the proprietary party in the latter they did not commence till the revolution and then sprung chiefly from personal animosities which spreading by little and little became at length of some extent dr lee was his principal calumniator a man of much malignity who besides enlisting his whole family in the same hostility was enabled as the agent of massachusetts with the british government to infuse it into that state with considerable effect mr izard the doctor's enemy also but from a pecuniary transaction never countenanced these charges against him mr j silas dean mr lawrence his colleagues also ever maintained toward him unlimited confidence and respect End quote. strangely enough franklin was saved from his countrymen by the intervention of france very early in the mission the ministry of that country deliberately took the step of ignoring franklin's fellow commissioners and again and again in granting aids stipulated to him that lee and adams should know nothing and so franklin was forced repeatedly in writing to congress to tell them that quote, the other commissioners are not acquainted with this proposition as yet i being expressly enjoined not to communicate it to any other person not even to the other gentlemen it was not strange under these circumstances that his fellow commissioners united in abusing him lee complained that quote, if dr franklin's jealousy and intolerant spirit together with the artifices successively employed had not incapacitated the other from serving their country and the common cause by their advice and information end quote, many imaginary ills would not have come to pass and adams asserted that Virginie's made franklin his confidant only because he could manage him as he pleased their fellow commissioner took all their abuse and plotting calmly and one anecdote will serve to show how little it moved him quote, mr z adams while at paris had often pressed the doctor to communicate with him his several negotiations with the court of france which the doctor avoided as decently as he could at length he received from mr z adams a very intemperate letter he folded it up and put it into a pigeon-hole the second third and so forth on to the fifth or sixth he received and disposed of in the same way finding no answer could be obtained by letter mr z adams paid him a personal visit and gave a loose to all the warmth of which he was susceptible the doctor replied i can no more answer this conversation than the several impatient letters you have written me taking them down from the pigeon-hole call on me when you are cool and good-humoured and i will justify myself to you dr lee's accusation of captain landis for insanity wrote franklin was probably well founded as in my opinion would have been the same accusation if it had been brought by landis against lee for though neither of them are permanently mad they are both so at times and the insanity of the latter is the most mischievous of adams franklin said the extravagant and violent language held here by a public person in public company which have a tendency to diminish the union with france are here and i hope there in america imputed to the true cause a disorder in the brain which though not constant has its fits too frequent End quote. 
whether it was jealousy or insanity the time came when practically the public business had come to a standstill and convinced of this franklin offered to resign but the french government interfered and through their american envoy secured the recall of franklin's rivals and the election of franklin as the sole minister to france the congress have done me the honor franklin said to refuse accepting my resignation and insist on my continuing in their service till the peace i must therefore buckle again to business and thank god that my health and spirits are of late improved i fancy it may have been a double mortification to those enemies you have mentioned to me that i should ask as a favor what they hoped to vex me by taking from me and that i should nevertheless be continued but this sort of consideration should never influence our conduct we ought always to do what appears best to be done without much regarding what others may think of it i call this continuance as honor and i really esteem it to be a greater than my first appointment when i consider that all the interest of my enemies united with my own request were not sufficient to prevent it End quote an interesting feature of these years of negotiation were the indirect overtures made franklin by the british ministry though george the third was convinced that hatred of this country is the constant object of franklin's mind he yet thought it quote, proper to keep open the channel of intercourse with that insidious man End quote. and through david hartley and other informal agents he endeavored to negotiate an arrangement which should regain at least a nominal sovereignty over the colonies and by ending the war with them enable england quote, to avenge the faithless and insolent conduct of france End quote but franklin held that the true political interest of america consists in observing and fulfilling with the greatest exactitude the engagements of our alliance with france and behaving at the same time towards england so as not entirely to extinguish her hopes of a reconciliation and so he refused to play false to an ally or consider reunion with great britain on any terms you may please yourselves and your children he told one of these negotiators with the rattle of your right to govern us as long as you have done with that of your kings being king of france without giving us the least concern if you do not attempt to exercise it that this pretended right is indisputable as you say we utterly deny your parliament never had a right to govern us and your king has forfeited it by his bloody tyranny End quote the english seem not to know either how to continue the war or to make peace with us he told washington even after yorktown but finally a treaty was concluded and his work done he returned homeward writing to the englishman who had striven most for peace the following farewell Quote, i cannot quit the coasts of europe without taking leave of my ever dear friend mr hartley we were long fellow laborers in the best of all works the work of peace i leave you still in the field but having finished my day's task i am going home to go to bed wish me a good night's rest as i do you a pleasant evening End quote. this hope for a rest was but elusive no sooner had he landed at philadelphia than Quote, the two parties in the assembly and council the constitutionists and the anti-constitutionists joined in requesting my service as counselor and afterward in electing me as president of seventy-four members in council and assembly who voted by ballot there was in my first election but one negative besides my own End quote i had on my return some right he acknowledged to a friend to expect repose and it was my intention to avoid all public business but i had not firmness enough to resist the unanimous desire of my country folks and i find myself harnessed again in their service for another year they engrossed the prime of my life they have eaten my flesh and seem resolved now to pick my bones End quote it is poetically appropriate that his last public service was performed in the federal convention and that no man in that body contributed more to bring about the lasting union of the states of which he had been among the earliest suggestors and for which he had worked so unceasingly his closing remarks 
whilst the last members were signing, form a fitting end to his own career. Dr. Franklin, looking toward the President's chair, at the back of which a rising sun happened to be painted, observed to a few members near him that painters had found it difficult to distinguish in their art the rising from the setting sun. I have, he said, often and often in the course of the session and the vicissitudes of my hopes and fears as to its issue looked at that behind the president without being able to tell whether it was rising or setting but now at length i have the happiness to know that it is a rising and not a Chapter 12, Part 1 of The Many Sided Franklin by Paul Lester Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 12, Social Life, Part 1. The busy man, quoth poor Richard, has few idle visitors. To the boiling pot, the flies come not. End quote. But this was only one of his many aphorisms, which he himself disproved, for, however manifold his occupations, there never seems to have been the time when he had not friends and the time to see them. With his first arrival in Philadelphia, he relates that, I began now to have some acquaintance among the young people of the town that were lovers of reading, with whom I spent my evenings very pleasantly, end quote so in london during his short sojourn there he went to the taverns and made friends of the ingenious frequenters in his voyage back to philadelphia too an incident served to show his social inclinations a passenger was detected marking a pack of cards was tried for it by his fellow voyagers and being convicted he was condemned to pay a fine and upon his refusal was excommunicated by the mess every one refusing to play eat drink or converse with him the embryo philosopher of twenty thereupon noted in his journal that quote, man is a sociable being and it is for aught i know one of the worst of punishments to be excluded from society i have read abundance of fine things on the subject of solitude and i know it is a common boast in the mouths of those that affect to be thought wise that they are never less alone than when alone i acknowledge solitude an agreeable refreshment to a busy mind but were these thinking people obliged to be always alone i am apt to think they would quickly find their very being insupportable to them End quote once established in philadelphia as already told he founded the social club of the junto for this little society franklin ever retained the warmest feelings many years after its beginning he wrote from england to a fellow member quote, i wish you would continue to meet the junto notwithstanding that some effects of our public political misunderstandings may sometimes appear there it is now perhaps one of the oldest clubs as i think it was formerly one of the best in the king's dominions it wants but about two years of forty since it was established End quote. still later when in france he said you tell me you sometimes visit the ancient junto i wish you would do it oftener i know they all love and respect you and regret your absenting yourself so much people are apt to grow strange and not understand one another so well when they meet but seldom since we have held that club till we are grown gray together let us hold it out to the end for my own part i find i love company chat a laugh a glass and even a song as well as ever and at the same time relish better than i used to do the grave observations and wise sentences of old men's conversation so that i am sure the gento will still be as agreeable to me as it ever has been i therefore hope it will not be discontinued as long as we are able to crawl together End quote. 
in his most active period franklin states in his autobiography quote, our club the junto was found so useful and afforded such satisfaction to the members that several were desirous of introducing their friends which could not well be done without exceeding what we had settled as a convenient number viz twelve we had from the beginning made it a rule to keep our institution a secret which was pretty well observed the intention was to avoid applications of improper persons for admittance some of whom perhaps we might find it difficult to refuse i was one of those who were against any addition to our number but instead of it made in writing a proposal that every member separately should endeavor to form a subordinate club with the same rules respecting queries etc and without informing them of the connection with the junto the advantages proposed were the improvement of so many more young citizens by the use of our institutions our better acquaintance with the general sentiments of the inhabitants on any occasion as the junto member might propose what queries we should desire and was to report to the junto what passed in his separate club the promotion of our particular interests in business by more extensive recommendation and the increase of our influence in public affairs and our power of doing good by spreading through the several clubs the sentiments of the junto the project was approved and every member undertook to form his club but they did not all succeed five or six only were completed which were called by different names as the vine the union the band etc they were useful to themselves and afforded us a good deal of amusement information and instruction besides answering in some considerable degree our views of influencing the public opinion on particular occasions of which i shall give some instances in course of time as they happened another expression of his social impulses in these years is shown by his being one of the organizers of the first masonic society in america in seventeen thirty in seventeen thirty two he was appointed a warden and in seventeen thirty four he was elected grand master on which occasion quote, a very elegant entertainment was provided and the proprietor the governor and several other persons of distinction honored the society with their presence end quote how by his exhibitions of electrical phenomena franklin's house was continually full for some time with people who came to see these new wonders has already been mentioned and there were other social incidents one of which he described as follows quote, it is proposed to put an end to our experiments for this season somewhat humorously in a party of pleasure on the banks of the schuylkill spirits at the same time are to be fired by a spark sent from side to side through the river without any other conductor than the water an experiment which we some time since performed to the amazement of many a turkey is to be killed for our dinner by electric shock and roasted by the electric jack before a fire kindled by the electrified bottle when the healths of all the famous electricians in england holland france and germany are to be drank in electrified bumpers under the discharge of guns from the electrical battery End quote his share in the association the hospital the academy and many other public-spirited affairs brought him into relation with all the prominent folk and he was socially received by the best as already told from these invitations his wife was omitted and as franklin for some years dwelt over his shop and later removed to a more quiet part of town at the corner of sassafras and second streets where he lived as to the appearance in modest circumstances there was no attempt to return the civilities in kind yet there was a welcome and a homely meal and room for all who chose to come mr francis spent the last evening with me franklin told the future president of king's college and we were all glad to hear that you seriously meditate a visit after the middle of next month and that you will inform us by a line when to expect you we drank your health and mrs johnson's remembering your kind entertainment of us in stratford End quote there are numerous such casual allusions to visitors in his letters and always in a way to show that they were boons to the host 
whenever franklin travelled as his concern in the post office often necessitated he was the object of the warmest hospitality of one visit to the northern states he said quote, i left new england slowly and with great reluctance short days journeys and loitering visits on the road for three or four weeks manifested my unwillingness to quit a country in which i drew my first breath spent my earliest and most pleasant days and had now received so many fresh marks of the people's goodness and benevolence in the kind and affectionate treatment i had everywhere met with i almost forgot i had a home till i was more than half way towards it till i had one by one parted with all my new england friends and was got into the western borders of connecticut among mere strangers another letter gives a glimpse of social hours in new jersey and new york quote, the corporation were to have a dinner that day at the point for their entertainment and prevailed on us to stay they were all the principal people and a great many ladies after dinner we set out and got here before dark we waited on the governor and on general amherst yesterday dined with lord sterling went in the evening to my old friend mr kennedy's funeral and are to dine with the general to-day with the outbreak of the bitter political contests over the proprietary government the court party pronounced an edict of social ostracism against him and henceforth he was tabooed at such houses as the allens shippens norrises and other aristocratic families one enemy declared that his friends had generally deserted him but on his return from his first mission to england franklin indignantly denied this writing quote, dr smith's report of the diminution of my friends were all false my house has been full of a succession of them from morning to night ever since my arrival congratulating me on my return with the utmost cordiality and affection my fellow-citizens while i was on the sea had at the annual election chosen me unanimously as they had done every year while i was in england to be their representative in assembly and would they say if i had not disappointed them by coming privately to town before they heard of my landing have met me with five hundred horse there can be no question that this regard was reciprocated from europe he wrote on one occasion quote, i thank you for the pleasing account you give me of the health and welfare of my old friends hugh roberts luke morris philip singh samuel rhodes etc with the same of yourself and family shake the old ones by the hand for me and give the young ones my blessing End quote on receiving word of the death of one he replied quote, i regret the loss of my friend parsons death begins to make breaches in the little junto of old friends that he had long forborne and it must be expected he will now soon pick us all off one after another End quote. when yet another break in his circle came he was quote, grieved to hear of the death of my good old friend dr evans i have lost so many since i left america that i begin to fear that i shall find myself a stranger among strangers when i return if so i must come again to my friends in england so he found cause for regret in the separation that his long agencies in great britain forced upon him but this exile though an honourable one he told a new england friend is become grievous to me in so long a separation from my family friends and country all which you happily enjoy and long may you continue to enjoy them i hope for the great pleasure of once more seeing and conversing with you and though living on in one's children as we both may do it is a good thing i cannot but fancy it might be better to continue living ourselves at the same time i rejoice therefore in your kind attentions of including me in the benefits of that inestimable stone which curing all diseases even old age itself will enable us to see the future glorious state of our america enjoying in full security her own liberties and offering in her bosom a participation of them to all the oppressed of the nations i anticipate the jolly conversations we and twenty more of our friends may have a hundred years hence on this subject over that well-replenished bowl at cambridge commencement 
once in england although he lived simply in lodgings he formed a wide and steadily growing circle of friends in his account of his agency to the pennsylvania assembly he informed that body that quote, i made journeys partly for the health and partly that i might by country visits to persons of influence have more convenient opportunities of discoursing with them on our public affairs the expense of which journeys was not easily proportioned and separated and being myself honoured with visits from persons of quality and distinction i was obliged for the credit of the province to live in a fashion and expense suitable to the public character i sustained and much above what i should have done if i had been considered merely as a private person and this difference of expense was not easy to distinguish and charge in my accounts i have lately made a journey of a fortnight to birmingham sheffield leeds and manchester he told a correspondent and returned only in time to be at court on the king's birthday which was yesterday so visits were made to bath and other english resorts two trips to cambridge with his son he described as follows quote, we stayed there a week, being entertained with great kindness by the principal people, and shown all the curiosities of the place, and returning by another road to see more of the country, we came again to London. I found the journey advantageous to my health, increasing both my health and spirits, and therefore, as all the great folks were out of town, and public business at a stand, i the more easily prevailed with myself to take another journey and accept the invitation we had to be again at cambridge at the commencement the beginning of july we went accordingly and were present at all the ceremonies dined every day in their halls and my vanity was not a little gratified by the particular regard shown me by the chancellor and vice-chancellor of the university and the heads of colleges End quote even more enthusiastically he wrote to lord kames of an excursion with his son into scotland quote, our conversation till we came to york was chiefly a recollection of what we had seen and heard the pleasures we had enjoyed and the kindnesses we had received in scotland and how far that country had exceeded our expectations on the whole i must say i think the time we spent there was six weeks of the densest happiness i have met with in any part of my life and the agreeable and instructive society that we found there in such plenty has left so pleasing an impression on my memory that did not strong connections draw me elsewhere i believe scotland would be the country i should choose to spend the remainder of my days in End quote his one grief so he told his lordship was that i did not press you and lady kames more strongly to favour us with your company farther how much more agreeable would our journey have been if we could have enjoyed you as far as york we could have beguiled the way by discoursing on a thousand things that now we may never have an opportunity of considering together for conversation warms the mind enlivens the imagination and is continually starting fresh game that is immediately pursued and taken and which would never have occurred in the duller intercourse of epistolary correspondence so that whenever i reflect on the great pleasure and advantage i receive from the free communication of sentiment in the conversation we had at kames and in the agreeable little rides to the tweed side i shall for ever regret our premature parting clearly the liking was reciprocal for not long after he again wrote to kames quote, your invitation to make another jaunt to scotland and offer to meet us half-way en famille was extremely obliging certainly i never spend my time anywhere more agreeably nor have i been in any place where the inhabitants and their conversation left such lastingly pleasing impressions on my mind accompanied with the strongest inclination once more to visit that hospitable friendly and sensible people the friendship your lordship in particular honours me with would not you may be assured be among the least of my inducements he was as good as his word in this for once again he journeyed northward a pilgrimage he described to his son as follows quote, in scotland i spent five days with lord kames at his seat blair drummond near stirling 
two or three days at glasgow two days at caron ironworks and the rest of the month in and about edinburgh lodging at david hume's who entertained me with the greatest kindness and hospitality as did lord kames and his lady all our old acquaintances there sir alexander dick and lady mr mcgowan doctors robertson cullen black ferguson russell and others inquired affectionately of your welfare i was out three months another friend he was fond of visiting was lord le despenser and on one if not more occasions he clearly forgot poor richard's warning that fish and visitors smell in three days for he told a correspondent that i spent sixteen days at lord le despenser's most agreeably and returned in good health and spirits elsewhere noting during another stay that i am in this house as much at my ease as if it were my own and the gardens are a paradise but a pleasanter thing is the kind countenance the facetious and very intelligent conversation of mine host who having been for many years engaged in public affairs seen all parts of europe and kept the best company in the world is himself the best existing yet a third british home to which he always went with especial pleasure was twyford the residence of his warm friend bishop shipley i now breathe with reluctance the smoky air of london franklin told him when i think of the sweet air of twyford and by the time your races are over or about the middle of next month if it should not then be unsuitable to your engagements or other purposes i promise myself the happiness of spending a week or two where i so pleasantly spent the last and in france he wrote one of the shipley girls your mention of the summer-house brings fresh to my mind all the pleasures i enjoyed in the sweet retreat at twyford the hours of agreeable and instructive conversation with the amiable family at table with its father alone the delightful walks in the gardens and neighboring grounds these were specimens of his true intimacies but there was much social intercourse of a more formal nature even to catalogue his friends and visits would be a task of no little magnitude but an extract from a semi-journal he wrote will best serve to give a slight idea of both and to show how his time was spent Quote, returning from bright helmstone i was called to visit my friend mr sergeant at his seat halstead in kent agreeable to a former engagement he let me know that he had promised to conduct me to lord stanhope's at chevening who expected i would call on him when i came into that neighbourhood we accordingly waited on lord stanhope that evening who told me that lord chatham desired to see me and that mr sergeant's house where i was to lodge being in the way he would call for me there the next morning and carry me to mr hayes this was done accordingly that truly great man received me with abundance of civility from hayes i went to halstead mr sergeant's place to dine intending thence to visit lord stanhope at chevening but hearing that his lordship and the family were in town i stayed at halstead all night and the next morning went to chislehurst to call on lord camden it being in my way to town i met his lordship and family in two carriages just without his gate going on a visit of congratulation to lord chatham and his lady on the late marriage of their daughter to lord mahone son of lord stanhope they were to be back at dinner so i agreed to go in stay to dinner Chapter Twelve, Part Two of the Many Sided Franklin by Paul Lester Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter Twelve, Social Life, Part Two. It is not to be supposed that there were not enemies as well as friends in these years, and Franklin's social experience with one of these gives an amusing insight into his character and governing principles of conduct 
for a number of years the earl of hillsborough was secretary of state for america and there was a persistent if veiled war between him and the colony agent yet in franklin's journal through ireland quote, being in dublin at the same time with his lordship i met with him accidentally at the lord lieutenant's who had happened to invite us to dine with a large company on the same day he was surprisingly civil and urged my fellow travellers and me to call at his house in our intended journey northward where we might be sure of better accommodations than the inns would afford us he pressed us so politely that it was not easy to refuse without apparent rudeness as we must pass through his town hillsborough and by his door we called upon him and were detained at his house four days during which time he entertained us with great civility and a particular attention to me that appeared the more extraordinary as i knew that just before we left london he had expressed himself concerning me in very angry terms calling me a republican a factious mischievous fellow and the like he seemed attentive to everything that might make my stay in his house agreeable to me and put his eldest son lord kilwarling into his phaeton with me to drive me around a forty miles that i might see the country the seats the manufactures covering me with his own great coat lest i should take cold all which i could not but wonder at when i had been a little while returned to london i waited on him to thank him for his civilities in ireland and to discourse with him on a georgia affair the porter told me he was not at home i left my card went another time and received the same answer though i knew he was at home a friend of mine being with him after intermissions of a week each i made two more visits and received the same answer the last time was on a levy day when a number of carriages were at his door my coachman driving up alighted and was opening the coach door when the porter seeing me came out and surlily chid the coachman for opening the door before he had inquired whether my lord was at home and then turning to me said my lord is not at home i have never since been nigh him and we have only abused one another at a distance End quote this affront franklin was presently able to revenge for he drew up a reply to a report of the secretary of so convincing a character that the ministry who desired but an excuse to oust hillsborough from the cabinet availed themselves of it to force his resignation yet though the earl knew of this and could never forgive me for writing that pamphlet he still masked his dislike Quote, i went down to oxford with and at the instance of lord le despenser franklin relates who is on all occasions very good to me and seems of late very desirous of my company that same day lord hillsborough called upon lord le despenser whose chamber and mine were together in queen's college i was in the inner room shifting and heard his voice but did not see him and he went downstairs immediately with lord le despenser who mentioned that i was above he returned directly and came to me in the pleasantest manner imaginable dr franklin said he i did not know till this minute that you were here and i am come back to make you my bow i am glad to see you at oxford and that you look so well etc in return for this extravagance i complimented him on his son's performance in the theatre though indeed it was but indifferent so that account was settled for as people say when they are angry if he strikes me i'll strike him again i think sometimes it may be right to say if he flatters me i'll flatter him again this is lex talionis returning offences in kind my quarrel is only with him who of all men i ever met with is surely the most unequal in his treatment of people the most insincere and the most wrong-headed the whole episode serves to illustrate two of poor richard's worldly wise remarks if any man flatters me i'll flatter him again though he were my best friend and he is not well bred that cannot bear ill-breeding in others it also throws a flood of light on some advice the earl of shelburne later the marquis of landown gave the english negotiator of the treaty of seventeen eighty three 
some people in this country he warned him who have too long indulged themselves in abusing everything american have been pleased to circulate an opinion that dr franklin is a very cunning man in answer to which i have remarked to mr oswald dr franklin knows very well how to manage a cunning man but when the doctor converses or treats with a man of candor there is no man more candid than himself there was too in these years in england more or less intercourse with the diplomatic corps how the french ambassador sought him out has been elsewhere mentioned but this was but one instance several of the foreign ambassadors franklin remarked have assiduously cultivated my acquaintance treating me as one of their corps partly i believe from the desire they have from time to time of hearing something of american affairs an object become of importance in foreign courts who begin to hope britain's alarming power will be diminished by the defection of her colonies and partly that they may have an opportunity of introducing me to the gentlemen of their country who desire it the king too has lately been heard to speak of me with great regard End quote still another element was club life not of the kind now termed such for institutions which have made it possible had not then come into existence it was then the mode for men to gather daily or weekly at some tavern and eat a dinner together the expense for food and wine being clubbed or shared when in france his letters to his friends in london often referred to a club he frequented while in england pleased to present my best respects to our good old friends of the london coffee-house he begged one correspondent i often figure to myself the pleasure i should have in being once more seated among them End quote. again he requested pleased to present my affectionate respects to that honest sensible and intelligent society who did me so long the honor of admitting me to share in their instructive conversations i never think of the hours i so happily spent in that company without regretting that they are never to be repeated i often think of the agreeable evenings i used to pass with that excellent collection of good men he told one of the members the club at the london and wish to be again among them perhaps i may pop in some thursday evening when they least expect me End quote. one letter he ended with a heartfelt wish to embrace you once more and enjoy your sweet society in peace among our honest worthy ingenious friends at the london End quote nor was the regard one-sided for a member informed him that the honest whig club drank your health very affectionately in sailing away from great britain david hume assured franklin that quote, i am very sorry that you intend soon to leave our hemisphere america has sent us many good things gold silver sugar tobacco indigo etc but you are the first philosopher and indeed the first great man of letters for whom we are beholden to her it is our own fault that we have not kept him whence it appears that we do not agree with solomon that wisdom is above gold for we take care never to send back an ounce of the latter which we once lay our fingers upon End quote the regret was quite as strong on that part of the voyager for in departing he declared that quote, i fancy i feel a little like dying saints who in parting with those they love in this world are only comforted with the hope of a more perfect happiness in the next i have in america connections of the most engaging kind and happy as i have been in the friendships here contracted those promise me greater and more lasting felicity upon the whole he said on another occasion i have lived so great a part of my life in britain and have formed so many friendships in it that i love it and sincerely wish it prosperity and therefore wish to see that union on which alone i think it can be secured and established End quote. as in his circle of friends in philadelphia he outlived the most of his intimates in great britain and in his last years heard with grief of one more bright Quote, the departure of my dearest friend which i learned from your last letter greatly affects me to meet her once more in this life was one of the principal motives of my proposing to visit england again before my return to america 
the last year carried off my friends dr pringle dr fothergill lord kames and lord le despenser this has begun to take away the rest and strikes the hardest thus the ties i had to that country and indeed to the world in general are loosened one by one and i shall soon have no attachment left to make me unwilling to follow it was in france however that his greatest social success was achieved twice while in great britain as a colony agent he had made trips to paris and among the scientists there had made a wide circle of friends and been won by the charm of the people the civilities we everywhere receive he told an english friend give us the strongest impressions of the french politeness it seems to be a point settled here universally that strangers are to be treated with respect and one has just the same deference shown one here by being a stranger as in england by being a lady on his return to england he could not but look back on quote, the time i spent in paris and in the improving conversation and agreeable society of so many ingenious and learned men which seems now to me like a pleasing dream from which i was only to be awakened by finding myself at london would to god he exclaimed in speaking of his intended return to america i could take with me messieurs dupont dubourg and some other french friends with their good ladies i might then by mixing them with my friends in philadelphia form a little happy society that would prevent me ever wishing again to visit europe End quote nor was it only in the scientific circles that he made acquaintances and the fame of his electrical experiments even secured him an invitation to the french court you see he wrote miss stevenson i speak of the queen as if i had seen her and so i have for you must know i have been at court we went to versailles last sunday and had the honor of being presented to the king he spoke to both of us very graciously and very cheerfully is a handsome man has a very lively look and appears younger than he is in the evening we were at the grand covert where the family sup in public the table was half a hollow square the service gold when either made a sign for drink the word was given by one of the waiters a boire pour le roi or a boire pour la reine then two persons came from within the one with wine and the other with water in carafes each drank a little glass of what he brought and then put both the carafes with a glass on a salver and then presented it their distance from each other was such as that other chairs might have been placed between any two of them an officer of the court brought us up through the crowd of spectators and placed sir john pringle so as to stand between the queen and madame victoire the king talked a good deal to sir john asked many questions about our royal family and did me too the honor of taking some notice of me that is saying enough End quote when franklin came to france therefore as a commissioner from the continental congress it was to a people not merely eager to espouse his country's cause but already somewhat acquainted with the man from the moment he landed and before it was even known what attitude the court would take toward him the lionizing began a welcoming ball was given him at nantes where he noted that quote, there were no women's headdresses less than five and a few were seven lengths of the face above the top of the forehead end quote. but as he journeyed toward paris he was persuaded to pause long enough to dine at the duc de rochefoucauld's where there were duchesses and a countess he remarked no head higher than a face and a half so it seems the farther from court the more extravagant the mode End quote. this entertaining was forced upon him before the object of his mission was divulged but quote, i find it generally supposed here that i am sent to negotiate and that opinion appears to give great pleasure if i can judge by the extreme civilities i meet with from the numbers of the principal people who have done me the honor to visit me End quote. 
once in paris although not openly recognized by the court in his diplomatic capacity every one united to show him honor and courtesy as already quoted he assured his sister that the account you have had of the vogue i am in here has some truth in it perhaps few strangers in france have had the good fortune to be so universally popular to his daughter he remarked the clay medallion of me you say you gave to mr hopkinson was the first of the kind made in france a variety of others have been made since of different sizes some to be set in the lids of snuff-boxes and some so small as to be worn in rings and the numbers sold are incredible these with the pictures busts and prints of which copies upon copies are spread everywhere have made your father's face as well known as that of the moon so that he durst not do anything that would oblige him to run away as his fears would discover him wherever he should venture to show it it is said by learned etymologists that the name doll for the images children play with is derived from the word idol from the number of dolls now made of him he may be truly said that in this sense to be idolized in this country figure me in your mind he asked a friend as jolly as formerly and as strong and hearty only a few years older very plainly dressed wearing my thin gray straight hair that peeps out under my only coiffure a fine fur cap which comes down my forehead almost to my spectacles think how this must appear among the powdered heads of paris yet it was in vain that the british ambassador sought to throw ridicule on the new envoy quote, i talk of him in a ludicrous manner and sometimes say for instance that the effect of his fur cap seems to be worn out and that i observe he is less talked of since the arrival of pacini the famous italian composer to his principal however he told another story quote, that physician de bourg whom your lordship has heard of sent cards all over paris testifying to his acquaintance the arrival of dr franklin i have already observed to your lordship that numbers of people resort to him franklin but there are very few persons of condition among them End quote then as if to complete the stormount he acknowledged that from the first the duc de choiseul and his party took franklin by the hand and quote, openly espoused the cause of the rebels end quote, and that the newcomer had formed a great intimacy with the duc de chartres i live here in great respect franklin himself said to a friend and dine every day with great folks but i still long for home and for repose and should be happy to eat indian pudding in your company and under your hospitable roof when john adams for a time his fellow commissioner joined him in paris and lived with him he shared in this unending hospitality and recorded in his journal that quote, invitations were sent to dr franklin and me every day in the week to dine in some great or small company end quote a complete chronicle of his social hours would be impossible but a glimpse here and there may well be taken from the diary of john adams are extracted the following to show some of the entertainments accepted by the two commissioners Quote, dr franklin presented to me the compliments of m turgot late controller of the finance and his invitation to dine with him went with dr franklin and mr lee and dined in company with the duchess d'anville the mother of the duc de la rochefoucauld and twenty of the great people of france dined with monsieur chaloux one of the farmers general we were shown into the most superb gallery that i have yet seen the paintings statues and curiosities were innumerable the old marshal richelieu dined there and a vast number of other great company after dinner mr chaloux invited dr franklin and me to go to the opera and take a seat in his logis we did the music and dancing were very fine dined at home with a great deal of company went after dinner to see the misanthrope of moliere with mr emile it was followed by the arousement dined at mr bertin's the secretary of state at his seat in the country 
dr franklin his grandson and i rode with madame bertin the niece of the minister in her voiture with four horses this day i had the honour to dine with the prince de tangri duc de beaumont of the illustrious house of montmorency went to the concert spirituel in the royal garden where was an infinite number of gentlemen and ladies walking dined with the duchess d'anville at her house with her daughter and granddaughter dukes abbots etc 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 dined with the marshal de malebois with a great deal of company here also we were shown the marshal's ami seated at the table with all his great company i could say but little but i understood her as well as any one i had heard in french it appears to me that the marshal had chosen her rather for her wit and senses than personal charms dined with the marshal de mouchy with the duke and the duchess diane their daughter the marquis de lafayette and the viscount de malebois her sister another sister unmarried the prussian ambassador an italian ambassador and a great deal of other great company End quote. one offset there was to the complete enjoyment of dining out for groaning at the innumerable applications of officers to him for employment franklin complained that quote, i am afraid to accept an invitation to dine abroad being almost sure of meeting with some officer or officer's friend who as soon as i am put in good humour by a glass or two of champagne begins his attack upon me End quote. until france recognized american independence the negotiators could not be received at court or by the ministry but once the treaty of amity and commerce was signed they became fully recognized diplomatic agents and the hitherto closed official doors were thrown open to them the whole court at the first function franklin attended united to heap attention and distinction upon him and from that time as if to make up for the brief period of non-recognition he was shown the utmost honour being bidden to the greatest and most exclusive affairs even to those given to royalty itself he describes an opera given to a royal prince at which he was present where quote, the house being richly finished with abundance of carving and gilding well illuminated with wax tapers and the company all superbly dressed many of the men in cloth of tissue and the ladies sparkling with diamonds formed altogether the most splendid spectacle my eyes ever beheld End quote in adam's diary is a reference to one ministerial dinner they went to given by vergennes there was a full table no ladies but the countess the count's brother the ambassador who lately signed the treaty with switzerland mr garnier the late secretary to the embassy in england Chapter 12, Part 3 of The Many Sided Franklin by Paul Lester Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 12, Social Life, Part 3. All these courtesies involved recognition, and Franklin seemed to have been, when able, fairly regardful of his social duties for only a few weeks of his many years in paris does he seem to have kept a diary but that little reveals him as doing conscientiously the required courtesies one afternoon's doings will suffice quote, we went to paris to visit princess dashkow not at home visit prince and princess Masserano, visit duke de rochefoucauld and madame la duchesse longueville visit misters dana and searle not at home leave invitations to dine with me on sunday visit comte d'estaing not at home mr turgot not at home End quote. in one respect he refused to go through the conventional forms although the recognition of the united states gave franklin full diplomatic status with the french court his fellow ambassadors whose governments had not yet acknowledged the new country necessarily could not accept him as one of their corps 
by good luck the american minister heard that they had come to the decision not to quote, return the visits i should make them as they supposed when i was first received here as minister plenipotentiary and disappointed their project by visiting none of them in my private opinion the first civility is due from the old resident to the stranger and newcomer my opinion indeed is good for nothing against custom which i should have obeyed but for the circumstances that rendered it more prudent to avoid disputes and affronts though at the hazard of being thought rude or singular out of this anomalous situation came an incident ridiculous enough which caused the envoy not a little amusement and which he narrated as follows quote, the count de nord who is son of the empress of russia arriving at paris ordered it seems cards of visit to be sent to all the foreign ministers one of them on which was written le comte de nord et le prince bariatinsky was brought to me it was on monday evening last being at court the next day i inquired of an old minister my friend what was the etiquette and whether the count received visits the answer was no on s'y fait écrire voilà tout this is done by passing the door and ordering your name to be written on the porter's book accordingly on wednesday i passed the house of prince bariatinsky ambassador of russia where the count lodged and left my name on the list of each i thought no more of the matter but this day may the twenty fourth comes the servant who had brought the cord in great affliction saying he was like to be ruined by his mistake in bringing the card here and wishing to obtain from me some paper of i know not what kind for i did not see him in the afternoon came my friend m leroy who is also the friend of the princes telling me how much he the prince was concerned at the accident that both himself and the count had great personal regard for me and my character but that our independence not yet being acknowledged by the court of russia it was impossible for him to permit himself to make me a visit as minister i told m leroy it was not my custom to seek such honours though i was very sensible of them when conferred upon me that i should not have voluntarily intruded a visit and that in this case i had only done what i was informed the etiquette required of me but if it would be attended with any inconvenience to prince bariatinsky whom i much esteemed and respected i thought the remedy was easy he had only to erase my name out of his book of visits received and i would burn their card the offer was accepted and the nameless danger thus avoided at the next attendance at court franklin noted that the quote, prince was particularly civil to me apologized for what passed relating to the visit expressed himself extremely sensible of my friendship in covering the affair which might have occasioned him very disagreeable consequences End quote. a diplomatic entanglement of much the same character though a very different conclusion occurred when the emperor joseph of austria came to paris in seventeen seventy seven he earnestly desired to make franklin's acquaintance but without giving it any political significance the minister of the grand duke of tuscany accordingly wrote the famous american quote, la belle nicole prit monsieur franklin de lui faire l'honneur de venir déjeuner chez lui mercredi matin le vingt-huit de ce mois à neuf heures du matin il lui donnera une bonne tasse de chocolat verbally he informed franklin that the intention was to give the emperor an opportunity of an interview with him but owing to an accident this meeting did not take place eventually they were brought together and jefferson relates something concerning one of their encounters Quote, when dr franklin went to france on his revolutionary mission his eminence as a philosopher his venerable appearance and the cause on which he was sent rendered him extremely popular for all ranks and conditions of men there entered warmly into the american interest 
he was therefore feasted and invited to all the court parties at this he sometimes met the old duchess of bourbon who being a chess player of about his force they very generally played together happening once to put her king into prize the doctor took it ah says she we do not take kings so we do in america said the doctor at one of these parties the emperor joseph the second then at paris incognito under the title of count falkenstein was overlooking the game in silence while the company was engaged in animated conversations on the american question how happens it monsieur le comte said the duchess that while we all feel so much interest in the cause of the americans you say nothing for them i am a king by trade said he with pardonable pride the self-made man speaking of his father's having quote, among his instructions to me when a boy frequently repeated the proverb of solomon seest thou a man diligent in his calling he shall stand before kings he shall not stand before mean men remarked that quote, i did not think that i should ever literally stand before kings which however has since happened for i have stood before five and even had the honour of sitting down with one the king of denmark to dinner greatly in demand as the minister was for formal entertaining there was as well a vie en team which has been more or less referred to already and which his recurrent attacks of the gout tended to foster of this life he has left a pleasant picture in his dialogue with the gout in which the disease accuses him of the following conduct quote, the gout let us examine your course of life while the mornings are long and you have leisure to go abroad what do you do why instead of gaining an appetite for breakfast by salutary exercise you amuse yourself with books pamphlets or newspapers which commonly are not worth the reading yet you eat an inordinate breakfast four dishes of tea with cream and one or two buttered toasts with slices of hung beef which i fancy are not things the most easily digested immediately afterward you sit down to write at your desk or converse with persons who apply to you on business thus the time passes till one without any kind of bodily exercise but all this i could pardon in regard as you say to your sedentary condition but what is your practice after dinner walking in the beautiful gardens of those friends with whom you have dined would be the choice of men of sense yours is to be fixed down to chess where you are found engaged for two or three hours this is your perpetual recreation which is the least eligible of any for a sedentary man because instead of accelerating the motion of the fluids the rigid attention it requires helps to retard the circulation and obstruct internal secretions wrapped in the speculations of this wretched game you destroy your constitution what can be expected from such a course of living but a body replete with stagnant humours ready to fall a prey to all kinds of dangerous maladies if i the gout did not occasionally bring you relief by agitating these humours and so purifying or dissipating them if it was in some nook or alley in paris deprived of walks that you played a while at chess after dinner this might be excusable but the same taste prevails with you in passe artuel montmartre or senoy places where there are the finest gardens and walks a pure air beautiful women and most agreeable and instructive conversation all which you might enjoy by frequenting the walks but these are rejected for this abominable game of chess fie then mr franklin but amidst my instructions i had almost forgot to administer my wholesome corrections so take that twinge and that franklin oh ah oh ah as much instructions as you please madam gout and as many reproaches but pray madam a truce with your corrections the gout do you remember how often you have promised yourself the following morning a walk in the grove of boulogne in the garden de la muette 
are in your own garden and have violated your promise alleging at one time it was too cold at another too warm too windy too moist or what else you pleased when in truth it was too nothing but your insuperable love of ease franklin that i confess may have happened occasionally probably ten times in a year the gout your confession is far short of the truth the gross amount is one hundred and ninety-nine times franklin is it possible the gout so possible that it is fact you may rely on the accuracy of my statement you know mr brillon's gardens and what fine walks they contain you know the handsome flight of an hundred steps which lead from the terrace above to the lawn below you have been in the practice of visiting this amiable family twice a week after dinner and as it is a maxim of your own that a man may take as much exercise in walking a mile up and down stairs as in ten on level ground what an opportunity was here for you to have had exercise in both those ways did you embrace it and how often franklin i cannot immediately answer that question the gout well i will do it for you not once franklin not once the gout even so during the summer you went there at six o'clock you found the charming lady with her lovely children and friends eager to walk with you and entertain you with their agreeable conversation and what has been your choice why to sit on the terrace satisfying yourself with the fine prospect and passing your eye over the beauties of the garden below without taking one step to descend and walk about in them on the contrary you call for tea and the chessboard and lo you are occupied in your seat till nine o'clock and that besides two hours play after dinner and then instead of walking home which would have bestirred you a little you step into your carriage how absurd to suppose that all this carelessness can be reconcilable with health without my interposition franklin i am convinced now of the justness of poor richard's remark that our debts and our sins are always greater than we think they are End quote it was in paris or rather in the suburb of passe that for the first time franklin was situated so as to entertain john adams who lived for a time with him describes the place Quote, i determined to put my country to no further expense on my account but to take my lodgings under the same roof with dr franklin and to use no other equipage than his if i could avoid it this house was called the basse cour de monsieur le Ray de chamont which was to be sure not a title of great dignity for the mansion of ambassadors though they were no more than american ambassadors nevertheless it had been nothing less than the famous hotel de valentinois with a motto on the door si sta bene non si muove from an englishman who came to the minister with a letter of introduction it is further learned that quote, his house was delightfully situated and seems very spacious and he seemed to have a great number of domestics we sent up the letter and were then shown up into his bedchamber where he sat in his nightgown his feet wrapped up in flannels and resting on a pillow he having for three or four days been much afflicted with the gout and the gravel End quote. franklin himself in answer to a question from a correspondent said you wish to know how i live it is in a fine house situated in a neat village on high ground half a mile from paris with a large garden to walk in i have abundance of acquaintance dine abroad six days in seven sundays i reserve to dine at home with such americans as pass this way and i then have my grandson ben with some other american children from the school in miss adams journal are brief accounts of two of these dinners today we have dined with dr franklin she wrote of one there was a large company our family the marquis de lafayette and lady lord mount morris an irish volunteer dr jeffreys mr paul jones 
we had a sumptuous dinner End quote. of the second she said quote, dined to-day at dr franklin's the whole company were americans except an old man monsieur brillon who is a friend of the doctor and who came as he said a demander un dîner à pere franklin End quote. a description of yet a third of these dinners has been preserved by jefferson quote, the doctor had a party to dine with him one day at passe of whom one half were americans the other half french and among the last was the abbe Raynal. at the dinner he got on his favorite theory of the degeneracy of animals and even of man in america and urged it with his usual eloquence the doctor at length noticing the accidental stature and position of his guests at table come says he monsieur l'abbe let us try this question by the fact before us we are here one half americans and one half french and it happens that the americans have placed themselves on one side of the table and our french friends are on the other let both parties rise and we will see on which side nature has degenerated it happened that his american guests were carmichael armour humphreys and others of the finest stature and form while those on the other side were remarkably diminutive and the abbe himself particularly was a mere shrimp he parried the appeal however by a complimentary admission of exceptions among which the doctor himself was a conspicuous one End quote. this open hospitality excited some criticism in america and franklin was warned that quote, our too liberal entertainment of our countrymen here has been reported at home by our guests and has given offence they must be contented for the future as i am he therefore said with plain beef and pudding the readers of the connecticut newspapers ought not to be troubled with any more accounts of our extravagance for my own part if i could sit down to dinner on a piece of their excellent salt pork and pumpkin i would not give a farthing for all the luxuries of paris End quote. apparently the decision was to his physical if not to his jovial advantage for john adams mentions that quote, franklin has broke up the practice of inviting everybody to dine with him on sunday at passe and he is getting better the gout left him weak but he begins to sit at table end quote. an amusing contrast to one of the great dinners that franklin and adams attended is supplied by adams who records that he quote, came home and supped with dr franklin on cheese and beer end quote. franklin's rules of conduct in society were well fitted to make him popular the wit of conversation he remarked consists more in finding it and others than showing a great deal yourself he who goes out of your company pleased with his own facetiousness and ingenuity will the sooner come into it again most men had rather please than admire you and seek less to be instructed and diverted than approved and applauded and it is certainly the most delicate sort of pleasure to please another the great secret of succeeding in conversation he said on another occasion is to admire little to hear much always to distrust our own reason and sometimes that of our friends never to pretend to wit but to make that of others appear as much as possibly we can to hearken to what is said and to answer to that purpose quote. in one of his bagatelles the handsome and the deformed leg he described the two sorts of people in the world who with equal degrees of health and wealth become the one happy and the other miserable and the need society has for protecting itself from the latter class quote, an old philosophical friend of mine was grown from experience he declared very cautious in this particular and carefully avoided any intimacy with such people he had like other philosophers a thermometer to show him the heat of the weather and a barometer to mark when it was likely to prove good or bad but there being no instrument invented to discover at first sight this unpleasing disposition in a person he for that purpose made use of his legs one of which was remarkably handsome the other by some accident crooked and deformed 
if a stranger at the first interview regarded his ugly leg more than his handsome one he doubted him if he spoke of it and took no notice of the handsome leg that was sufficient to determine my philosopher to have no further acquaintance with him everybody has not this two-legged instrument but every one with a little attention may observe signs of that carping fault-finding disposition and take the same resolution of avoiding the acquaintance of those infected with it it was one of the rules which above all others made dr franklin the most amiable of men in society jefferson related never to contradict anybody if he was urged to announce an opinion he did it rather by asking questions as if for information or by suggesting doubts End quote. he was friendly and agreeable in conversation miss logan states which he suited to his company appearing to wish to benefit his hearers i could readily believe that he heard nothing of consequence himself but what he turned to the account he desired and in his turn profited by the conversation of others end quote. it is little wonder that an eye-witness reports that quote, when he left passe it seemed as if the village had lost its patriarch end quote. nor was the break felt on one side alone and franklin wrote from america that he quote, could not forget paris and the nine years happiness i enjoyed there in the sweet society of a people whose conversation is instructive whose manners are highly pleasing and who above all the nations of the world have in the greatest perfection the art of making themselves beloved by strangers and now even in my sleep i find that the scenes of all my pleasant dreams are laid in that city or in its neighborhood manessa cutler who called upon franklin in his philadelphia home in seventeen eighty seven draws a pleasant picture of his last years dr franklin lives in market street he states between second and third streets but his house stands up a courtyard at some distance from the street we found him in his garden sitting upon a grass plat under a very large mulberry with several other gentlemen and two or three ladies there was no curiosity in philadelphia which i felt so anxious to see as this great man who has been the wonder of europe as well as the glory of america but a man who stood first in the literary world and had spent so many years in the courts of kings particularly in the refined court of france i conceived would not be a very easy access and must certainly have much of the air of grandeur and majesty about him common folks must expect only to gaze at him at a distance and answer such questions as he might please to ask in short when i entered his house i felt as if i was going to be introduced to the presence of a european monarch but how were my ideas changed when i saw a short fat trenched old man in a plain quaker dress bald pate and short white locks sitting without his hat under the tree and as mr jerry introduced me rose from his chair took me by the hand expressed his joy to see me welcomed me to the city and begged me to seat myself close to him his voice was low but his countenance open frank and pleasing he instantly reminded me of the old captain cummings for he is nearly of his pitch and no more of the air of superiority about him i delivered him my letters after he had read them he took me again by the hand and with the usual compliments introduced me to the other gentlemen of the company who were most of them members of the convention here we entered into a free conversation and spent our time most agreeably until it was dark the tea-table was spread under the tree and mrs bosch a very gross and rather homely lady who is the only daughter of the doctor and lives with him served it out to the company she had three of her children about her over whom she seemed to have no kind of command but who appeared to be excessively fond of their grandpapa franklin himself has left an equally pleasant description of this closing period of his life Quote, i have found my family here in health good circumstances and well respected by their fellow-citizens the companions of my youth are indeed almost all departed but i find an agreeable society among their children and grandchildren 
i have public business enough to preserve me from ennui and private amusement besides in conversation books my garden and cribbage considering our well-furnished plentiful market as the best of gardens i am turning mine in the midst of which my house stands into grass plots and gravel walks with trees and flowering shrubs cards we sometimes play here in long winter evenings but it is as in france they play at chess not for money but for honour or the pleasure of beating one another this will not be quite a novelty to you as you may remember we played together in that manner during the winter at passe i have indeed now and then a little compunction in reflecting that i spend time so idly but another reflection comes to relieve me whispering you know that the soul is immortal why then should you be such a niggard of a little time when you have a whole eternity before you so being easily convinced and like other reasonable creatures satisfied with a small reason when it is in favour of doing what i have a mind to i shuffle the cards again and begin another game End quote. to a friend he wrote we loved and still love one another we are grown grey together and yet it is too early to part let us sit till the evening of life is spent the last hours are always the most joyous when we can stay no longer it is time enough then to bid each other good night separate and go quietly to bed this ends the many-sided franklin by paul lester ford read for you by michelle fry in baton